All right, good morning. Um, this is Jakob Baslander. I'm a senior associate with the World Resources Institute, and it's my pleasure to host uh, as moderator the uh, GCF uh, private investment uh, for climate event on commercial banks. Achieving the climate targets is it a matter of time. Um, I have a couple of uh, logistical remarks. Uh, uh, Julie, the next slide, please. Uh, the session will be recorded. Please use the Q&A um, button to ask your questions and the presentations will be made available after this meeting through the uh, WOVA app. Uh, Julie, the next slide, please. Um, it's my pleasure to announce the panel for this morning. It's, it's, uh, it's really uh, some eminent colleagues I have here uh, who will present around the topic of commercial banks. Uh, Stephanie Kwan uh, from the Green Climate Fund, uh, the senior uh, accredited entity specialist um, from World Resources Institute. We have Joe Thwaites, associate uh, with the Sustainable Finance Center. Um, Ariel Pinchot, also uh, associate from the Sustainable Finance Center. Nate Aiden uh, from uh, WRI's Business Center, working for the Science-Based Targets Initiative. Uh, Julie Boss, a research analyst with the World Resources Institute's uh, Sustainable uh, Finance Center, as well as Gili Wu, also a research analyst, working with the Sustainable Finance Center. You may think it's about commercial banks. Where, where are the bankers? Uh, the bankers, uh, uh, it's our intention to now give more the conceptual overview uh, and at a future event, uh, the bankers should be, uh, in our view, the center stage. So um, on the objectives, um, what we want to do today is uh, explore what the role is of commercial banks. In our view, the role of commercial banks is important for transitioning to a, a green economy. And so we want to identify opportunities for uh, banks and their clients to accelerate the shift. And action uh, must be taken. And we want to see, uh, Julie, the next, um, Julie, yeah. We uh, want to accelerate change towards um, uh, the uh, net zero emissions e economy. And that is because we believe that commercial banks are one of the key providers of financial resources and services. And uh, they are uh, the ones who uh, can influence the way uh, their clients, often businesses, individuals, uh, are doing their business. Uh, and so the banking sector in itself facilitates the transition to a net zero emissions economy. Um, next slide, please. The uh, agenda for today, and this is my last slide, um, is uh, first of all, uh, GCF, um, uh, Stephanie Kwan will uh, present the accreditation policy, which is the linking pin for the Green Climate Fund uh, with uh, accredited entities, which include commercial banks. And Joe Thwaites from WRI will add on with some specific observations for the re-accreditation of uh, certain entities. Um, secondly, we will have a presentation from Arielle Pinchot about the Green Targets tool, which she has developed with some of her colleagues, uh, which picks how uh, commercial banks are performing. And the Science-Based Targets Initiative has uh, launched earlier this month uh, a methodology for the banking sector, how they can set their science-based targets, and Nate Aiden will give an introduction to this new development. And as a final uh, presentation, we will have new ongoing research, which will be outlined to you by Julie Boss and Yili Wu, and in roughly 45 minutes, you will see me back for the closure of this session. The floor is now uh, for uh, Stephanie Kwan. Stephanie, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Jakob, and very much a big thank you to WRI colleagues as well for uh, allowing me to speak on this panel. Um, if we could go to the next slide, uh, I'll start off with what I'm sure all of you know in terms of the GCF, the fact that we are a partnership organization. We work with organizations that are called accredited entities. Next slide. Uh, 
Thank you. In terms of programming with the GCF, you'll see that ultimately GCF is providing financing for projects and programs in terms of climate change in developing countries. And the way in which we do that is vis-a-vis -vis the accredited entities. These entities are working from the side of design uh, to implementation and ultimately closure and monitoring of those various projects. We have a various pipeline uh, here that you can see in terms of that entire development. And ultimately, again, these should be aligned with what the country priorities are in terms of climate change. What's key to note here is that um, we are looking for entities that can provide this kind of programming development ultimately to developing countries. And it's about identifying which organizations might be most suitable to deliver on that particular pipeline. Next slide. Here you'll see so far since 2014, the GCF has accredited 99 partners. These include a variety of direct access organizations. So these are entities that are based in developing countries. They range from uh, local NGOs to government institutions, to local development institutions and commercial banks, to the international access entities, which also range um, from commercial banks uh, to IFIs, MDBs, UN agencies, and international NGOs. Out of this group of 99 partners, 22 of them are private sector partners, while of course many more also engage with the private sector. Next slide. Um, just very briefly in terms of the role of the accredited entity, I mentioned already that the idea is these are organizations designing and developing projects, uh, funding proposals to the actual imp implementation of these projects. Um, this is particularly key because we've noted that uh, with the variety of organizations we've accredited, each organization does this in a very different way. Next slide. Here you'll see um, the information in terms of what we call fit for pur purpose accreditation approach. And the reason behind this is that we're looking at not only having a variety of institutions, but making sure ultimately they have the corporate level systems to be able to manage financial, environmental, social, and gender related risk. Um, just to call attention to a few things here, you'll see that in terms of project size, we can work with organizations that work with micro-sized projects all the way to large-scale projects, which is above $250 million. Uh, this is particularly a key, especially for large financial institutions um, that typically work within this particular range. In terms of the various fiduciary functions, we note that organizations might focus on managing projects. Others may be focusing on awarding grants. Um, the GCF, of course, can work with loans, equity, and guarantees as well. So we also work with many institutions that um, can also work in these areas of financial structuring. And the last, of course, is different levels of environmental social risk. We want to make sure any of our projects have this layer as well in terms of the risk management aspect. Um, just coming to my last slide, next. Um, in terms of the process and noting that the design of the accredited entity is intended to be able to be a partner for the GCF, we ourselves are not on the ground, um, but rather we expect our partners to do so. So in that sense, the accreditation process takes a look at those corporate systems that GCF will lean on, the financial, environmental, social, gender-related systems that I mentioned earlier. And through this process, we're checking whether or not each institution has the relevant capabilities um, and has a track record of doing so. More importantly, of course, um, the accreditation process is for a period of five years of engaging with GCF. And Joe will go over in a moment the uh, reaccreditation process. A key factor for us to look at in reaccreditation is whether or not organizations have performed, meaning whether they've brought forward projects, whether they continue to align with the GCF's mandate and objectives, and ultimately with the Paris Agreement as well. Um, so I'll stop there, but thank you very much for the opportunity to present a little bit about the GCF accreditation process. Back to you. Thank you, Stephanie, and uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, please, Joe, continue with uh, your perspective on the reaccreditation of entities. Thank you very much, uh, Jakob, and uh, thank you, uh, Stephanie. That was a great overview of accreditation. So, what I'm going to do is, is speak very briefly about about the reaccreditation process, um, and particularly a, a very interesting approach. Uh, that, it, that it has that has the potential to incentivize financial institutions, including uh, commercial banks, uh, to better align their activities with, with climate goals. 
So, so as Stephanie mentioned, entities uh, are accredited for five years, and after that point, they must get re-accredited. Uh, and that includes assessing, again, their policies, but also their performance across a variety of areas. The first set of entities will be up for re-accreditation next year. Um, but back in 2016, the board agreed that it was going to start tracking how the accredited entities' overall portfolios are evolving to support low carbon and climate resilient development. And that this will be taken into account when the board makes a decision on reaccreditation of, of any given entity. And I think this is a really interesting theory of change. And you can see that the board decision uh, on the left of the slide there. Um, essentially, what the board is doing is leveraging the G GCF's prestige, the fact that entities want to partner with the fund. And, and saying to those entities, if you want to continue working with us, it's not enough just to use our money to finance green projects, although that is obviously a very, very good thing. You also need to be taking serious steps to align your overall portfolio with the GCF and indeed the Paris Agreement's goals. And in, in some ways, it's sort of an anti-greenwash provision, if you like. And I think if this provision is applied effectively, if it is a serious factor in determining whether the GCF will continue working with entities, it could ultimately end up incentivizing the shift of more financial flows towards uh, green objectives than even the fund's direct financing. And that would be a really fantastic way for the GCF to leverage its resources uh, to have the largest possible impact. So where are things right now? Well, the Secretariat and the accreditation panel are piloting a baseline portfolio indicator tool with 15 accredited entities. And they, that's a representative sample that, that captures the variety of different entity types, uh, including private sector entities that the GCF has accredited so far. Um, and this is a process to watch really closely. It will be important to learn from the pilot and to make adjustments to the tool if necessary. And it could perhaps draw on the research and approaches that we'll hear about from my colleagues later in the session, but also from, from other organizations and other data sources. And it will be important for the board to actually give the results of this tool serious consideration when they do make the determination on whether to re-accredit entities. Um, and I think the final thing to say is that that this approach has, has the potential for benefits far beyond the GCF. If it works well, it, the methodology could be applied to assess how any financial institution, including commercial banks, is shifting its portfolio. It, it could also be used by the, the global stock take of the Paris Agreement, which among other things, has to assess how well global financial flows are being aligned with climate goals. So there's a real opportunity to turn this provision into something big that can help a wide array of financial institutions measure and track their progress in aligning their portfolios with climate objectives. So I'd really sort of end with encouraging everyone to follow this process, to provide inputs from your research and experience uh, on assessing green alignment, uh, so that this provision can deliver on its transformative potential. Thank you. Back to you, Jakob. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Thank you for this uh, addition, and uh, Stephanie, also thank you very much. In the meantime, questions are coming in, and um, it would be helpful. There are two relating to the Green Climate Fund. Uh, Stephanie, if you could also have a look at it, as well as Joe, and see whether already online you can give some replies in, in the chat, uh, or sorry, in the Q&A function. Um, but in the meantime, we proceed with uh, Ariel, um, Ariel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jakob. Um, I'm very glad to have the opportunity today to tell you about the tool we developed called the Green, Green Targets Tool um, to look into su sustainable uh, finance commitments from private sector banks. And as leading players in the global finance arena, we believe that private banks have an opportunity to serve an important role in financing the transition to a low carbon climate resilient economy. And one way we noticed banks starting to step up to this task was by setting sustainable finance targets, which are publicly made time bound commitments to provide or facilitate um, often um, billions of dollars in capital for climate and sustainability solutions. And these commitments are sending a really encouraging signal from banks and providing a much needed source of capital for sustainability challenges. But at the same time, we recognize that there's a lot of nuance to these commitments. So whether a bank's commitment represents a step to driving real change is a, is a bigger question. And we developed the Green Targets tool to provide further insight into this inquiry. 
So we designed the tool with the objective of providing a common understanding of the commitments and our intention is not to classify whether a commitment is good or bad, but rather to unpack the nuances and provide users with the information needed to interpret the commitment and decide for themselves. And in terms of our objectives, uh, we're, we're hoping that with an improved understanding of the commitments, the tool can help bank stakeholders assess the planned contributions and hold banks accountable to their promises and encourage greater ambition. And that banks can also use the tool to help improve their understanding of the general components of a commitment and, and benchmark themselves against their peers. And overall, our hope is that this will help encourage banks to set more transparent and ambitious commitments and ultimately drive more uh, private capital towards solving global sustainability challenges. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, uh, so how did we do this? Uh, at the core of the tool is an analytical framework, which we developed to assess the commitment design and portfolio context, which stops short of actually evalu evaluating implementation. Um, but the framework considers three main elements of the commitments, specificity, accountability, and magnitude, and each of these is further broken down into three indicators. So on specificity, the indicators are looking at the level of details the bank is disclosing about the commitment with respect to the sustainability criteria, the type of financial services, and the time horizon. On accountability, we're looking into transparency of, of tracking and measuring the commitment. And finally, on magnitude, we consider the annualized commitment relative to the bank um, to, uh, size and to their average annual fossil fuel financing levels. And the framework was informed by research and early consultations with key experts and including several banks. And we've published a technical note, which is available on our website and that outlines the methodology in greater detail. Um, next slide, please. We then applied this framework against um, the 50 largest private sector banks. And this sample includes a handful of banks accredited by the Green Climate Fund. Um, and at the time of our analysis, which was July, 2019, 23 of these banks had active commitments. So we published the findings and analysis on, on the interactive platform. And that platform, the Green Targets tool, shows standard information on the 23 active commitments, um, shows whether the commitments meet the basic criteria of our framework, and puts figures into annualized terms, benchmark, benchmarks the commitments against the assets, revenues, and average fossil fuel finance for each bank, and enables comparison across banks. I'll just note that all the data presented is as of July 2019, so any up, new or updated commitments since then are not reflected in the tool, unfortunately. Next slide, please. In terms of what we learned from this, uh, so we learned as expected that there's a lot of variation in terms of the definitions of the commitments. Uh, with respect to sustainability criteria, we found that the commitments in the sample cover a pretty wide range um, in terms of the themes and activities counted. So some are more narrowly focused on topics like renewal, renewable energy while others um, center around the Paris alignment and some have an even broader focus on SDG alignment. So pictured on the slide is just a sample of some of the sustainability criteria from a handful of the banks, just to give a sense of what, what they might look like. Um, in terms of the financial services and products counted under the commitments, we also see a lot of variation. So some are restricted to just lending and equity investments, while others include underwriting, advisory service, and um, brokerage services. And the time horizons range from five to 14 years with an average of, of about eight and a half years. So it's just important to take note of these terms when interpreting and comparing the commitments. Next slide, please. Um, so we also found that most of the commitments meet um, the basic criteria outlined in our qualitative indicators for specificity and accountability. But the one area where the majority fall short is in disclosing their accounting methodology. So fewer than half of the banks in the sample um, disclose an accounting methodology for tracking the commitments. And this is really important because there's no widely used standard accounting methodology for sustainable finance. So without disclosing this information, we have little insight into how the bank will count different financing activities and transactions. And undoubtedly, some banks will be more liberal than others in quantifying the spending. So this makes it difficult um, for banks to benchmark their commitments against their peers and also for stakeholders to hold them accountable um, to the commitments. Next slide, please. Um, so here we looked at annualized commitment relative to the average annual fossil fuel financing with respect to bank size. And this graph shows that most banks um, invest more in fossil fuel finance each year than their annualized sustainable finance commitments. So all the banks below the diagonal line fall into this category. Um, 
at the time of our study, only seven of the banks had annualized sustainable finance targets that were greater than the amount of finance they provide for fossil fuel related transactions each year. And we see this as an essential point of comparison when trying to understand whether the target signals a genuine commitment to sustainability. And our analysis shows that most banks do have room for improvement. Um, I'll note that it is encouraging to see that in the past year, um, five of the six largest US banks pledged to end um, funding for new drilling and exploration in the Arctic. So that's a step in the right direction. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this all really just underscores the importance of contextualizing the commitment with these additional details. So by itself, the volume of finance in a commitment is not particularly meaningful, especially when comparing um, pledges, for example, um, uh, of, from banks of different sizes. Um, so this graph here um, shows a snapshot of the commitments to further highlight this point. So these are ordered by the bank's total assets. Um, the green bar is the total commitment. Yellow is the annualized commitment and the shade of green indicates the degree of clarity. So a darker color means that they're disclosing greater details about the commitment. And what the graph shows is that um, the commitments, first of all, aren't uh, really proportional to the size of the bank. So the smallest commitment here has has the large, uh, the smallest bank rather has the largest commitment, but also this largest commitment in fact has the poorest clarity. So it has the lightest green color um, and meaning that the bank has provided um, very little insight into what the commitment means and how it's how it's being measured. Um, basically, this is showing um, the importance of unpacking these details in order to fully understand the commitment and its potential for meaningful impact. Um, if you are interested in learning more about a bank's commitment, I encourage you to check out the tool and explore the data for yourself. And I'll, I'll drop the, the, the link um, in the chat in a moment. Um, next slide. Um, <clears throat> before wrapping up, I just wanted to note that while the tool is a helpful resource to improve our understanding of the commitments, it does have some limitations. Um, first, most notably, as I mentioned, we're not looking at implementation, just the design. So the tool doesn't really provide insight into the impact of the financing, for example, how the financing <clears throat> contributes to emissions reductions. Um, and that's obviously a really important part of, of, of understanding the effectiveness of a commitment. Um, and second, sort of related, it's limited in its ability to answer this bigger, bigger question of how well a bank is aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, a commitment is often just one aspect of a bank's sustainability efforts. So the strength of, of this commitment can't really speak to the bank's overall sustainability position. <clears throat> to get um, answers to that question, you have to look more broadly about how the bank is aligning its entire <clears throat> business with sustainability goals. And that increasingly includes um, pledges to reduce portfolio emissions, including through setting net zero emissions targets. Um, and that actually leads right into our next segment of the presentation, um, where Nate will tell us more about, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> the methods they've developed to support these efforts under the Science-Based Targets Initiative. Um, so I'll pass it on to Nate. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. And uh, thanks, Jacob, for hosting us. And thanks to GCF uh, for Letting us join uh, this this meeting this week. So I, as um, Ariel mentioned, will be providing uh, a fairly high level overview of the resources that the Science Based Targets Initiative provides for banks and other financial institutions to set targets for their investment and lending portfolios. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, the Science Based Targets Initiative is a collaboration between WRI, CDP, WWF, and the UN Global Compact. And it was launched back in 2015 to support private sector mitigation ambition in aligning with the Paris Agreement in terms of having targets that align with uh, well below two degrees Celsius climate stabilization this century. Uh, when we launched the initiative in 2015, we had a couple of financial institutions. In fact, we had 10 financial institutions commit to setting science-based targets that year. Uh, and that was uh, great and unexpected uh, in terms of the number of initial commitments. Uh, now we have 60 financial institutions from more than 20 countries that have publicly committed to setting science-based targets. And we've held those financial institutions in abeyance until this month when we finally released a framework for developing and assessing those targets. And so that's what I'll be talking about today. 
The next slide gives uh, an overview of the framework. We have four components in this framework. The first is the methods that we developed um, last year with a couple dozen financial institution road testers. The second is uh, a set of more than 20 criteria that we use to evaluate the targets. The third is a new open source tool that we've developed to guide financial institutions engagement um, with their investees to have them set their own targets. And the fourth is a guidance document that describes these first three components, but also presents sort of a how-to for financial institutions for setting targets and also includes case studies and other additional information. So the next slide uh, just provides um, some explanation on the three methods that we have included at this point in the um, framework. So the first is a physical intensity based method that we developed uh, with companies in the real economy back in 2015 and we call it the sector decarbonization approach and it takes uh, sectors where there's a relatively homogenous um, denominator or production value such as electricity generation and it, is, it comes up with uh, emissions intensities for those sectors. So for example, gram CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour of electricity generated or gram CO2 equivalent per square meter of uh, building space. And so um, that method uh, is valuable for some financial institutions to, um, to use when they do have linkages with those particular sectors. For example, if they have a mortgage or real estate portfolio. The second uh, and third methods are engagement oriented methods. And so the second is uh, the science-based targets portfolio coverage approach, which is the idea that the financial institution engages with their investees for them to set their own science-based targets. And um, the current uh, configuration of this approach is that um, financial institutions need to have 100% coverage by 2040 and a linear basis. So uh, if in this year, 2020, they have zero coverage, then they would need to have 25% coverage by 2025. The third approach is a new one that we've developed um, where the portfolio of the bank or other financial institution is assigned a temperature rating based on the uh, targets of the holdings of that financial institution. And that is one single score from the aggregated portfolio. And so we could say that's, you know, for example, 3.4 degrees in 2020, and the target would be to reduce it to 1.7 degrees in 2025. Um, these three methods, as you can see in the next slide, have been mapped on to a series of asset classes that we're covering in this phase of the project. And so it's focused on real estate, mortgages, electricity generation project finance, and then the broader asset class group of corporate instruments, and that's debt and equity. And so um, the physical intensity approach that I mentioned is applied to the first three. And then corporate instruments includes all three of the methods that we're presently using. Clearly, this is not um, completely comprehensive with regard to banks or other financial institutions portfolios. Uh, both in terms of the asset class coverage and the methods. And uh, that is understood. Uh, it's, it's partially by design. Um, this pilot phase, which runs from this month through April of 2021, is intended for us to refine these methods and to understand where there's the most need for additional method coverage, and also to start to have a process for reviewing alternate methods um, for target setting to incorporate into this framework. The next slide uh, just gives an overview of the criteria that we use with financial institutions. And as I mentioned, there are more than 20 criteria um, that are um, covered here. Uh, and there are also numerous recommendations. Uh, but suffice to say that um, the sort of most complex for most financial institutions are the coverage requirements uh, and so we've developed a sort of uh, per financial product coverage requirement approach with thresholds and mapping of these methods to particular products, for example, um, listed equities or uh, mortgages, corporate loans, etc. 
Uh, and so um, this is all detailed in, uh, in great depth in our criteria. There's a separate criteria document, uh, which is about 20 pages, and um, that just pulls the criteria out from the guidance, but they're also included in the broader guidance document. The next slide just gives uh, a brief sort of snapshot of the uh, tool that I mentioned. It is an open source Python tool, uh, and we do intend for it to be used both by uh, large financial institutions with their own data lakes, but also by the data and service providers um, that are um, supporting many of these financial institutions. And already um, this tool is being integrated into these, uh, these data and service providers offerings. The next slide um, just provides um, a snapshot of the guidance. And uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned, 170 page document, but it does include these eight case studies from financial institutions that highlight uh, how they have used these particular methods and resources. Uh, the last one there, Wells Fargo is a US bank and they used PCAF, which is the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials to start to um, calculate the emissions associated with their lending portfolio. And um, that is an input for many of our physical intensity uh, methods that I mentioned. The next slide just gives some sort of zoom out context. Um, the SBT initiative uh, <clears throat> is obviously one of a broad range of initiatives um, covering um, climate in the financial sector. Um, and it's intended to be complementary to all the other initiatives that are out there that look at high level commitments to act, measurement of finance emissions, which I just mentioned, uh, scenario analysis, we're obviously focused on target setting, but the criteria um, also include reporting requirements. And so that's why that's covered here as well. Um, but it's not uh, certainly not comprehensive and we understand that. And um, so we do uh, seek to harmonize with these other initiatives as much as possible. Finally, my last slide just um, gives some information in terms of uh, if, if you are with a financial institution and are interested in pursuing this, um, I would encourage you to, to check out our project website on the right here, and I can also drop the URL into the chat box. Um, and if you would like to uh, have a target um, to be reviewed by the initiative, then please email targets at sciencebasedtargets.org and we can initiate that process. Thanks uh, for your attention, and um, I'll pass it now to Julie or Jakob. Yeah, thank you, Nate. Thank you uh, for this uh, very interesting presentation. And uh, great if you can indeed drop the link in the chat box, that would be very helpful. Um, I remind uh, panelists that there are a couple of questions which came up mainly relating to the Green Climate Fund's accreditation process. And I see some answers coming in. If we have time towards the end of the, the, uh, this presentation, uh, we will try to Come back especially to Stephanie uh, to give uh, some further uh, feedback uh, on the questions asked uh, and please do not uh, shy away uh, audience of uh, posing questions uh, please come forward with with your observations and and questions they're most welcome um, now the floor is to Julie who will uh, start the presentation on the commercial banks new research which WRI is currently engaging in Julie the floor is yours Thank you, Jacob. Um, let me go to the next slide. Yes, as the previous presentations already stressed, commercial banks can play a crucial role in the transition to a net zero emission economy in line with the objectives of the Paris Agreement. WRI initiated a new research into how commercial banks can align their business and operations with the Paris Agreement. Under commercial banks, we categorize banks from all regions that are for profit, who have publicly traded shares, and we include all types of banking functions, like retail banking, corporate banking, and wealth management banking. Because commercial banks are the main provider of financial products and provide financial services of millions of individuals, Commercial banks are a key linking pin in the current transition to a green net zero economy. They have the opportunity to use their position to support 
their co customers to become greener, whether they are public sector institutions, corporate clients, small and medium-sized businesses, or individual clients. But in order to facilitate the transition of their clients, the commercial banks themselves also have to make changes in the way they operate and they do business. Commercial banks already have made important announcements about new green finance lines they have uh, introduced. Ariel already explained the magnitude of these commitments, but at the same time, Ariel also indicated that just a new green finance business line by banks is not enough. Banks should also focus on reducing the greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions of their entire portfolio. WRI's finance center's new research is exploring how a bank's business model could shift to become aligned with the objectives of the Paris Agreement. This will require major internal changes in the way they operate and do business. Think about incorporating science-based emission reduction targets, as just explained by Nate, or think about internalizing climate risks and monitor how these risks um, are developing as part of the TCFD initiative. With our new research, we aim to learn lessons from the banks who are making these transitions, and we try to help banks understand how they can make these internal changes in their business model. There is, of course, no one-size-fits-all solution, and that is why uh, our WRI team is looking for concrete examples and concrete steps which banks are currently making to change the way they are doing business to become Paris aligned, while at the same time also keeping their competitive edge. The business model of a bank has many quite standardized features. Most of them uh, can be seen in the picture uh, on the slides in the graph. Uh, the exact role, functioning, and emphasis of each element varies, but all these elements are part of the beating heart of a bank. And all of these elements will be influenced by the green transition. To develop relevant and in-depth insights into the way banks can transition their internal operations, we decided to zoom in on two of these key elements, namely client engagement and products and services. We consider uh, these two elements as key in the trans transition, given the fact that internal changes will accumulate in their interface between commercial banks and the clients. It will also have an effect on the products and services To investigate which, which transitions banks are currently making in these areas and which challenges they are facing, we are currently wrapping up uh, our desk research in which we analyze the annual reports of around 35 banks uh, from different regions and different sizes. We are now entering the interview phase in which we want to talk with bank officials from selected banks on the basis of a semi-structured interview protocol. On top of this more qualitative analysis, we are also conducting a quantitative analysis. Uh, and my colleague Yili will now explain more about this financial analysis. Thank you, Julie. Um, like Julie said, we looked at the annual reports to better understand a bank's business model in addition to their sustainability ambitions and commitments. In addition to that, we also analyzed each bank's financial statements to better understand their geographic breakdown as well as what products and services they focus on as a bank. For all of these banks, we collected information for certain financial metrics to better understand a bank's financial health and also the financial performance of each bank. Some of the metrics that we looked at included the return on equity for the past two years, efficiency ratio to better understand how costs are managed, and also um, each bank's various credit ratings from major credit rating agencies in order to better understand the bank's value for both equity and debt holders. Given that the subset of banks that we are looking at is extremely diverse, we are aware that um, we don't necessarily use these indicators to compare across banks and each bank is unique. 
and we use this information more so to better understand a bank's business and financial strategy and how each bank can possibly have a more smoother shift in the future. And this information was all used prior to the interview stage for the banks. Thank you. Oh, I think Jakob, maybe you're on mute. You're right. Yes, now we're on, on, on mute. Thank you, uh, Yili. Thank you, Yili and uh, Julie, for this presentation on the ongoing research. And uh, what is uh, the ambition is uh, to have a uh, paper ready for publication in April 2021. Uh, that would be around the World Bank IMF Spring Meetings. And that's also where we intend to have a, a couple of workshops uh, where also uh, we uh, would like to offer uh, the center stage to uh, bank representatives to share their vision and also their experiences on the how to move forward. And uh, as mentioned here on the screen, uh, our email addresses are, are here. Um, we love your feedback. So if you have information, ideas, suggestions, experiences uh, relating to how commercial banks are making this shift towards uh, financing uh, net zero emission uh, investments, uh, let us know. That would be very interesting for us. Now, uh, before I close, uh, we have two minutes left. And I've seen that Stephanie has been very wor uh, working very hard in the meantime to answer several questions which came up. Uh, but I would uh, appreciate uh, another two minutes for Stephanie if there is anything uh, you would like to add, and I, I particularly liked the first question, which you have been replying to actually, but the question by Nima um, on the um, banks which are undergoing a paradigm shift uh, towards uh, net zero emissions, um, how that would relate uh, to their chances to become accredited to the Green Climate Fund. Uh, Stephanie, um, could, could you come in? Uh, and I can give you uh, uh, two minutes, uh, and after that, I, I will close the session. But Stephanie, uh, are you uh, there, and could you uh, pick up uh, these questions? Yes, thank you very much, Jacob, and, and again, thank you very much to all of the participants for um, for this session. I've seen some of the other questions coming in as well. Um, but Jakob, to your question about the uh, the first question posted in the chat, um, about commercial banks uh, that are undergoing the paradigm shift as it's going through the accreditation process. Um, just to reiterate again for the GCF that we are looking for a paradigm shift at two levels. It's not just at the project level, but truly it's about the longer term shift in terms of the business model, the business practices, uh, because the notion here is that if those systems are improved, uh, if climate change, environmental and social safeguards, gender safeguards, uh, fiduciary safeguards are mainstreamed within an organization. This helps the organization overall, not just to access GCF climate finance, but possibly climate finance from a number of different organizations. It also helps to change the overall trend, hopefully towards increasing uh, portfolios and investment in climate change activities. Um, so through accreditation, that is very much an aim to be able to strengthen those capacities and corporate systems across the different, uh, different standards that are there. That being said, particularly for, um, for private sector organizations, we have seen um, particularly areas of improvement with respect to environmental and social safeguards and gender. For GCF, it's not just at the level of the direct partner that we're working with, but we also require entities to pass down all of these GCF standards for all of the engagements that they have downstream, meaning the work with the clients and ultimately to the beneficiaries of these projects. Um, so through that way, we are trying to uh, basically address climate change through the entire chain of activities vis-a-vis -vis our partners. Back to you, Yako. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this addition. And this was very helpful to see how this accreditation process works. Uh, that besides GCF, there are other financial providers as well. But what I in particular find very in, uh, interesting is this potential leverage effect that by accrediting um, um, major institutions that they also engage in 
uh, respecting the GCF principles and uh, embedding them in their way they work. And that is what I find extremely interesting. Um, so um, with this, um, we have come to the end of this session. And I would like to thank the audience for uh, being so patient with us. Um, on the number of questions, I could see that uh, there was uh, an important engagement. Uh, don't hesitate to contact us if you have further questions. You can uh, have a look at the uh, slides uh, on the WOVA app. And I understand that also the presentation will be uh, attached to the WOVA app. So also, if you want to look to certain uh, presentations again uh, with the comments, uh, then please go ahead. You'll find it on the app. Thank you once again uh, for us here in the US. It's the start of a nice new day. And for you over there in Asia, have a nice e evening. And uh, thank you, GCF, for giving us the opportunity to make this presentation. Take care. Bye.